Coming up, the minimum wage debate hits Kansas City. It's not enough to pay bills. It's not enough to make rent every month. If we're trying to alleviate poverty, uh, raising the minimum wage will, will work against that end. Next week, the city council will decide whether to boost the wages of the city's lowest paid workers. It is unexplainable that we all live in the richest, most powerful, best country in the world and people work 40 hours a week and cannot feed their families. For years, efforts to raise the minimum wage at the federal and state levels have faltered. Now some of the biggest cities in America are taking matters into their own hands. Los Angeles is now the largest U.S. city with a minimum wage of $15 per hour. L.A. just joined Seattle and San Francisco in passing $15 an hour laws. Will Kansas City join them? It'd be devastating. He's the owner of M. Shama's Brazilian restaurant in the Northland. He says he'll have to move the restaurant and his 50 employees out of the city to survive. What would a wage hike mean for business owners? Downtown pizza. We just have to figure it out and hopefully we'd be able to keep going. But this city is, is surrounded by many other municipalities and each one of those, if they, you enact a separate minimum wage, would result in tremendous loss of business. What would it mean for those scraping to get by? If we had more money uh, and we make the more money, we're going to spend it. We're going to put it back in the economy, which would essentially grow jobs. What would it do to the price of a hamburger? This week, we're on location at UMKC as we partner with the Village Square to pick apart the issue with advocates Dr. Vernon Howard of St. Mark's Church and Laura Granich, director of Missouri Jobs for Justice, plus opponents Carlos Gomez, head of the Kansas City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and small business owner Annie Presley, who runs a local publishing company. And now to our moderator, the national director of the Village Square, Scott Helm. Dr. Howard, let me start with you. Why $15 an hour? The issue of uh, poverty in America and also poverty uh, right here in Kansas City, Missouri, is a severe uh, public health and public safety issue uh, that must be addressed if Kansas City is going to continue to strive uh, toward uh, being the livable and lovable city uh, that we hope for it to be. We understand that the minimum wage needs to move towards becoming a living wage for the people who are getting up and going to work every day and mm -hmm. playing by the rules. Mm -hmm. um, $15 isn't even that. It takes a lot more than that to raise a family in Kansas City. Even one adult and one child takes more than $20 an mm -hmm. hour to make ends meet, and that's if you can get 40 hours a week at your job, mm -hmm. which is a, a big struggle for a lot of low-wage workers in this community. We also believe that $15 is great for the local economy. You know, as this um, minimum wage gradually phases in, the businesses in this community have an opportunity to benefit from the increased buying power of these low-wage workers in the community. And so that rising tide can lift all boats. I'm going to turn to Annie this time. You mentioned employing more than 200 people throughout your career. Uh, how do minimum wage increases impact your decision to hire? When you start a small business, the goal is to grow. And the easiest way to get started is to hire capable people for the jobs they are asked to do. It's, it's pretty simple, really. And so the goal is to truly find staff and talent that has a skill set that's appropriate to what you're asking them to do. And then ideally, they are engaged at a higher level as time passes and the business grows. While I don't disagree with your passion about the issue, I am very, very much concerned about what a launch from 765 in Kansas City to even 10 or $15 would do to the small businesses that create numerous jobs in Kansas City and across the nation. Carlos. Some would see the opposition to an increased minimum wage as ironic since the perception is that members of the Hispanic community are among those who potentially benefit the most. How would you respond to that as the executive director of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce? How I would respond to that is uh, we are looking out for our community to, to ensure that small business is allowed to prosper and grow. Because at the end of the day, that small business owner 
minorities hire minorities. Women hire women. So when you uh, have laws that may deter a small business, a minority business, to uh, go under or to uh, go the opposite direction, they're going to hire less people in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and we need those small businesses. You will not have a healthy neighborhood without healthy small business on that local corner. The raise in Kansas City would be 97% to go to 15 over mm -hmm. a period of time, mm -hmm. which would be the largest in the country. Should advocates have a greater concern for the potential negative impacts of an increase to 97%? Well, I think advocates are primarily concerned with the families getting up every day and trying to make ends meet on $300 a week. Mm -hmm. And we know that they can't wait to, to get a living wage that helps them bring economic stability to their families. Mm -hmm. We believe that that's why the gradual increase that is built into the proposal is so important, and we think that that gives businesses enough time to really adapt, benefit from the increased spending in the community, and, and be able to, to for everyone to come out ahead together. Mm -hmm. We see the cities that um, have already increased their minimum wages, cities that are already at a very high level, the sky hasn't fallen. Dr. Howard. Over the course of the last uh, 50 years or so, what we have seen is that in the United States of America uh, that the earnings and the power of the dollar for those who are the working poor has either stayed stagnant or diminished, while in fact what has happened at the top half of earners and wage earners in America has increased. Might yeah. I add this, the poverty rate right here in Kansas City is 19.1%. For the state of Missouri, it is 15%. We are lagging behind as a city. If we reward persons for taking the per personal responsibility to work, then we ought to honor that personal responsibility and give them a just wage. Mm -hmm. If we do not, we will see the kinds of public safety and public health issues not just centered around Troost and Van Brunt, not just centered around the river and 85th Street, but we will see it pour over into other areas as well. This is about the urban core in Kansas City, but also it is about the total metro and how we become a community. If we go too high, even over a gradual period of time, everyone could be a, a loser in this situation. And with the difference, if the highest wage increase has been at 61% so far, according to these studies. Mm -hmm. And to go to 97, they're saying, we don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't there be more concern about that potential? Well, we would say we, we don't, maybe we don't know what's going to happen based on that study. Yes. But we do know what is happening now, and families are living in poverty. Okay. So what we do know is that under the current system, there is an enormous part of our community that is struggling to survive. Carlos. There's an MIT living wage calculator. I don't know if you, you both are familiar with it. It essentially states that an individual in Kansas City, an individual, uh, would require over a $9 an hour wage to sustain uh, an above poverty life in Kansas City. The current wage level is not at that level. Is it ethically appropriate to employ someone at a level some view as a poverty wage? I think there's a misconception of small business owners that small business owners don't want to give a living wage to their employees. Um, these are their families. These are folks that take care of their customers. And it's a highly competitive world, no matter what industry you're in. Mm -hmm. How you're going to win in any industry is your, your labor, your employees. That's the, that's the difference between you and your competition. Mm -hmm. So business will pay for quality folks, and they have been. You know, a Waffle House just announced uh, next year they're starting at $15 an hour with benefits entry level. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't need a, the government to tell them to do that. And that's their choice. That's their right. But what we have to be concerned about is that small mom and pop business who has fixed in, uh, expenses. Mm -hmm. They can't change their rent. They can't change their insurance. And if we almost double their labor, that's the only thing that they can adjust. And any small business owner will tell you they get paid last. I think what you have to think about is the fact that there are lots of jobs out there and there are lots of people who want to work. So I'm having lunch with my banker today and I said, tell me what you think about minimum wage and raising the minimum wage in Kansas City. I said, do you know anybody who makes minimum wage? And he said, well, my son. And so the kid's working at a pizza place. He makes $7.50, which is the Kansas rate. And I said, do you think he's worth it? And he said, absolutely not. <laughs> 
because he's young, he's learning on the job. And I said, but is there value? Yes, we agreed that he's learning to get up and be there on time. He's learning to balance his checkbook. He's learning social skills. He's learning how to make pizza. And he's most importantly learning that he doesn't want to make pizza the rest of his life. Now, that's the role, in my mind, of a low minimum wage. So you can get people out there and going. It doesn't matter if it's a high school kid or a mom who wants to go back to work. They have to start somewhere. And you can't start at a wage that you don't have a skill set for. And I also would encourage you guys to think more clearly about the mm, unintended consequences of just raising the minimum wage. Because if you would call, say, Sister Berta down at Operation Breakthrough, where they provide daycare for moms, children who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford daycare, they are scared if the minimum wage goes up, they are penalized, and their food stamps are reduced. They oftentimes get out of sync with the ability to qualify for their daycare, and it puts the whole program in turmoil. So the unintended consequences are very, very important, and I think this is one of the biggest problems with government is they rush to solve one problem and they cause others. Great. Scott, may yeah. I respond? Uh, very, very quickly and then I'm going to go to Nick. Um, while we are encouraged to think more clearly about unintended consequences, uh, I'd like to encourage the other side to think more broadly uh, that the Kansas City community and the nation uh, has a much greater spectrum than a white male banker's son who is impacted uh, by, the, okay. yep. uh, by the minimum wage. Whiteness, maleness, and upper class uh, jobs and ownership of financial institutions are not the persons who are hurting and living in misery every day and every week and every month in Kansas City. Let me relocate you from your suburban house to a house near 12th and Euclid where I pastor and where we have social services that are helping people to pay their rent, helping people to keep hot water on, helping people to buy shoes for their children and make sure they have coats in the winter, that there is a young man who is perhaps 17, 18, 19 years old, and I come to tell you he is more than worth $7.50. He is worth what a human individual is worth who is willing to work. And so the money that he earns does not go into a surplus yep. of a white male banker who benefits from this economic system. Okay. The money that, may I finish? The money that he makes goes to help his single parent mother mm -hmm. or his mother and his father, both of whom are working poverty wages and his income is needed just to keep the family healthy. Yeah. Okay. Right. Nick, I think we're seeing some clear differences up here. What are you seeing out there? Absolutely. Lots and lots of questions Great. coming in. Many of them don't want to ask their own questions, but I am here to help provide that voice and poke and prod our panelists. Uh, Owen wants to know about, is this really about alleviating poverty, as some of our panelists mentioned? The biggest issue to Owen is the skills gap. We are not addressing, uh, instead of offering the uh, incenting of higher pay to remain in a low skills job, why aren't we finding ways to incentivize fast food chains to subsidize the continuing education or training of their employees instead of increasing hourly wages? So investing in the skills of um, workers in our community is really critical and this is a both and approach. These things are not um, contradictory to one another. Yes, we do need to invest in people to get the skills to get some of the higher wage jobs available, mm -hmm. but the fact is there are not enough family supporting jobs in our economy yes. to support people who need them. So we yes. also need to raise, raise the floor under the jobs that exist. The fastest growing jobs in Kansas City, the most openings, are retail clerks, fast food, mm -hmm. restaurant servers, and cashiers. And all None wage. of those support even one adult and one child. Okay. But what do, what do you do when the businesses start moving? They leave your locale because they don't want to have to pay $15 an hour. They, they cut their jobs. They cut their benefits if they have them. They cut, they, they go to automation. I mean, some of you guys might remember when they're elevator operators. Now we have ATMs, we have self-service checkout, we, there are no 
toll booth collectors. There are scanners everywhere. Uh, Amazon produces robots that can pack a box faster than any human being. You know, that's the force that you're applying mm -hmm. to the product. These are important considerations, but I would say that there, when we see um, wages rise, we also see turnover reduced. We see productivity rise. So that businesses experience real internal savings as well. There's a plus sign on that calculator, not just a minus sign. And that's why we simply haven't seen these kind of consequences in places where we've seen wages rise. I see hands going up right yeah. and left. I'm going to come to you next, Carlos. So okay. let, let's go to Nick again. Judy, your question? Thanks. Um, since a majority of our minimum wage workers are people who earn less than 15 in Kansas City don't work for small business, but in fact work for large employers, why are we just talking about how this is going to impact small business when they're really a minority of the issue? We're talking big companies, and they can well afford it. As the chamber, Hispanic chamber, we, this conversation is not just talking about big business, it's encompassing small business. And we have to remember all those big businesses were started once as a small business. So if we have laws that aren't conducive to, uh, for small business to grow, where will we get our next Cerner, our next Burns and McDonald, our next Hallmark? Uh, those all, H&R Block, was, was started with one or two people. And that's why you have to protect these small businesses and allow them to grow. Doctor, I'm going to let Dr. Howard sure. weigh in. Well, the, the, the thing that I would say is that, is that uh, we have to get, I believe, uh, to a point uh, where everybody wins, uh, where there is not this uh, situation in our economy and in our cities, states, and our government, where for business to win, labor has to lose. When, when demands come upon a business, for example, to increase expenses with respect to insurance and indemnification, or with respect to sales and marketing, or with respect to transportation, or with respect to energy. The business buckles down, gets ingenious, begins to think of creatively and innovatively about how that business can maintain profits and continue to do what it does within its industry. When it comes to greater expense for labor, however, there seems to be a narrative of gloom and doom. We cannot invest in people, but we can make the adjustments to deal with other things. So what do we do? If not minimum wage, then what to lift people out of poverty? I think we look at policies that incentivize business, that allow, that make your city and county and state attractive for business to come. Because when we create more jobs, guess what? Businesses have to pay more for the talent. So you, if, if we want higher wages, what can we do, what policies can we put in place that will attract more businesses to open up and start and expand in Kansas City? Straight ahead, more audience questions from Pearson Hall at UMKC on this Week in Review on the Road. But first, minimum wage workers speak out. It's extremely hard because right now, if anyone that's working minimum wage can work a full 80 hours every two weeks and they're only bringing home three to four hundred dollars, that's half of a light bill or half of a gas bill. So it's extremely hard to live on 735 in this, in this economy. It's not enough to pay bills. It's not enough to make rent every month. I live in fear our utilities will be shut off every month. You know, it's hard to afford food sometimes. It's rough. My jobs don't match up off days, so I work seven days a week. I'm up early in the morning, often before my kids awake, and I'm home at night. By the time I get home, they're asleep. So it's consecutive days I don't see my kids. Me and my fiance, we barely see each other. It's a brief high and by. So it's really damaging to my family structure. It's not normal. Turn it up, turn it up. Me and my fiance, and we both work. I work two jobs, so if you do it, it's three incomes, three jobs. And yet we still get food stamps. We'd rather make our way and go to work and make money and not have to get food stamps or depend on Medicaid. But I can say now I would not be able to feed my kids without food stamps. 
So I, I, I appreciate, and, and a lot of workers appreciate the program, but for a person that's up working every day, it shouldn't be that way. My mom worked in fast food for as long as I can remember. When I was born, she worked at Godfather's. When my little brother was born, she worked at McDonald's. <laughs> when my other sister was born, she worked at Wendy's. She always struggled to pay rent, to make sure we had food. Four days after I turned 16, I started my first, my first job at Pizza Hut. My oldest daughter just turned 16 a few months ago and started her first job at Steak and Shake as a server. I desperately want to break this cycle. I don't ever want my children to settle for less. I want them to know that they are worth more. I'm gonna to go to Nick. I saw, I saw yes. your hand go up. We have a Sly James here. I don't know if, I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but... The name's um, familiar. Mayor James? Thank you, Nick. I'd like to know if we could ask our panelists so that perhaps we could see if they have gained any insight about the other side. I'd like to know if the panelists could argue the opposite side so that we could hear what they are actually learning about why this has huh. to be a shared decision as opposed to an imposed decision. Can we wait for the crickets? No, <laughs> um, no I mean, I think something I have heard is um, anxieties about the unknown. And so I want to acknowledge that an anxiety about the unknown and not being able to predict what's coming mm -hmm you know, um, on the part of the business owner is, is something that I have, I have sympathy for. Dr. Howe? It's hard for me to uh, argue against people that uh, I serve and speak for who are suffering such misery every day and every week, but I can say um, that as a leader of a faith-based organization, uh, to have, as some persons have said, uh, unexpected increases in expenses uh, to come upon you and to be able to handle and deal with that. I want to go to this side. I believe people should make more money. I, I don't, I, I'm not opposed to, and we're not opposed to uh, people making a livable wage. We just don't believe that the, at, at a local level that's the answer. Um, when you say I, at the I local level, you mean from a city, policy? City, yeah, policy level. Annie, please. I, I hear your passion. There's no question about it. And I, I empathize with everyone who struggles with feeding their family and getting by. I represented a number of nonprofits over the years as a professional fundraiser, including St. Mark's when Reverend Sam Mann was there. So I'm very, very familiar with the struggles day to day of people who are just having a hard time getting by. I don't believe changing the minimum wage to a higher level is the answer. If we just make a new rule that is a broad brush for every business, regardless of its size or scope, I feel like that unintended consequence will cause all kinds of other issues. Nick, I'm going to be dismissing this panel briefly. I thought we might want to go to the audience for just, one just more question. a couple question. of questions here. Rex Archer has yes. a question. The Severett Coop of Kansas City. <laughs> uh, Kansas City Public Health Director. Well, one question is, we've heard most of these arguments from business when we were looking at non-smoking policies and none of these came true. Uh -huh. Why do we believe they'll occur now? Some of them were blanket. Kansas passed a uh, uh, blanket no smoking. Uh, so it was a, it created more of an even playing field for the state of Kansas. But when we're in a metro city, when we have a border war, and we have, we, what we don't need is uh, giving incentives not to invest in Kansas City, Missouri, or in Jackson County. And I can tell you, working with small business every day, the cost of labor will be a, a decision maker. Can I actually, I think that's a great point, though. Um, a lot of these arguments about the idea that we're going to be, you're going to cause people to hop a border because you change a rule really didn't bear out in smoking bans. And, Smoking bans are a good illustration of the thinking behind why we want to have the opportunity to, to raise minimum wages at the local level so that you're able to set a floor at the federal level. You can innovate above it at the state level and innovate above it again at the local level helps us figure out if we can really meet our higher aspirations on a local level. And then when that works, we can do it statewide. We can do it in bigger areas. We do need clarification, though. I think from your fact checkers, Nick, if you could, because it's my understanding that the state of Missouri has a limit of 765 on minimum wage, and the locality, Kansas City, Missouri, cannot raise 
the minimum wage above what the state is. So this conversation in regard to Kansas City, Missouri is somewhat um, off-putting. Well, in actuality. In hold actual, on, hold on, let, let sorry, Andy finish, sorry. I'll come to you. Because we're going to have to have a, a rule change at the state level, which is sort of what I've been advocating for. Well, in actuality, you, you, you are uh, making reference to a law uh, uh, that was on the books uh, several years ago. And you're making reference now to House Bill 722, which now states that you can do it as long as you do it by the 28th. So the General Assembly has said, you can't do it. But then it has turned around and drafted legislation says, you can do it. But you just have to do it by the 28th of August. To my colleagues on my left, worst case scenario, is there a number that you could live with with the minimum wage increasing to? You know what, I would say uh, the marketplace has, has to dictate it. Would you consider growing at the rate of inflation to be com comparable to the marketplace? That I think would be reasonable. Okay. That would be common ground. Indexing it is a really a great idea, but that's a policy that we'd have to undertake. We'd have to look at it and figure out what, what the, the rate would be. To this side, is there, I understand the dignity. At what point, at what wage level does, does dignity start? Does it have to be 15? Dr. Helm, I think the way that you uh, phrased the question originally is very ironic. You said, what can we live with? And the question is not what we can live with. The question is what poor working people can live with. And if the wage was livable, if it was a living wage, it would actually be, based on our figures, about $21 per hour that persons could live on. 15 is a compromise in and of itself. I think Dr. Howard said it well. Great. Hmm. Will you please help me thank our four fantastic panelists in this civil debate? Coming up next, a team of economists add weight, breadth, and depth to our conversation. But first, our friends at Time Magazine take us on a 90-second whirlwind tour through minimum wage history. In 1938, the very first federal minimum wage was set at 25 cents an hour when Franklin Roosevelt signed the Fair Labor Standards Act. The wage is not tied to the rate of inflation, so it only goes up through congressional action. And 22 times since 1938, Congress and the President have worked together to raise it. Here's a look at when the wage has gone up over time. Keep an eye on the number in blue, which shows you how much that amount would be worth in today's dollars. peak, the minimum wage in 1968 was worth 1075 in today's dollars, but the purchasing power that goes with it has not kept up. So if you earned minimum wage in the 1960s, it was enough to fill up your basket with a week's groceries. But those earning minimum wage now would have to put some of those items back. Let me introduce our, our second panel. Scott is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, writing and researching in governance, federal budgeting, national security, and the economy. Before that, he served 31 years with US Congress as staff director of the House Appropriations Committee. Bill Greiner, he's the chief investment strategist for Mariner Wealth Advisors. Bill has appeared on hundreds of local and national news outlets, has been featured in Barron's, The Wall Street Journal, and Business Week, and Forbes. And finally, Michael Saltzman. Uh, he's the research director at the Employment Policies Institute. His writing and research have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post. Before that, he worked as an economist for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I'm going to jump right into it, Bill, with you. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, you had the opportunity to hear from our local stakeholders. Yeah. One of the things that came up is this history of, right. of the minimum wage. The statement that um, the doctor made up here before is right. It depends on, but it depends, as far as the minimum wage staying up with inflation, 
It depends on what time frame you look at. The last 25 year period of time, the minimum wage has gone up faster than inflation. Since inception, since 1938, when the minimum wage first came out, compared to today, uh, if you had the minimum wage at 25 cents an hour, which it was in 1938, inflation adjusts that number, the minimum wage today would be $4.20 per hour. And indeed, today it's $7.25 per hour. Michael, can't read an article about the minimum wage without your name popping up in it? So I think that if we all agree on the first question, which is that are, do we have an interest in, in reducing poverty and helping low-wage workers? I think we can all agree that the answer to that question is yes. So the, the next question has to be is what's the best way to achieve it? And I would submit to you that if, if we're going to take the examples that were used on the previous panel of the 17-year-old of the from a low-income neighborhood, uh, of a single mother who's coming to the workforce maybe without a lot of, of uh, formal education, that setting the full-time bar at $30,000 a year for them to be able to get their first job and get into the workforce is not the right way to accomplish that. My organization, the Employment Policies Institute, is actually strongly supportive of policies like the Earned Income Tax Credit, um, which boosts wages through the tax code instead of through a mandate uh, on low margin employers. Uh, I believe that it's not an either or thing. We don't advocate for getting rid of the minimum wage, but I do think that if you're trying to reduce poverty, there are better strategies. And I think particularly in this debate about the $15 minimum wage, um, part of why I think it's so important that, that, that Kansas City has been so thoughtful about this is because when people say we're in uncharted territory, that is true. And what we're seeing coming out of the West Coast right now is not data yet because it's, it's so soon that, you know, that, that Seattle is starting its march to 15, that Oakland has gone to 12 and a quarter, that San Francisco is starting to go to 15. We don't have hard data yet, but what we do have is really frightening anecdotes. These are businesses who have been written up in the San Francisco Chronicle, the Oakland Tribune um, of child care providers who have had to lay off staff and raise rates, of small pizza restaurants that have actually had to close their doors, uh, of other businesses that I have talked to, small manufacturers, who are now competing with people who have labor cost rates just in the next city over that are dramatically lower than theirs are. So these are real stories, and that's, that's why I think, especially at the $15 number, it's really important to be thoughtful and to be careful about how you move ahead with it. Great. Thank you. Scott. I say, first of all, I, I feel somewhat in the middle in this discussion. Is I grew up in a household uh, in the Missouri Ozarks, uh, with a father who ran a small business. Uh, uh, he was a merchant, had five or six employees. Uh, and I know how close to the line a lot of small businesses are, and that no one goes into business or creates a single job unless he thinks he can make a return on that that will, will uh, repay the capital that he's put into hiring the person. And I think that's one reason the, uh, the business community gets frustrated with this conversation is that there's not enough realization uh, that, that we've got to make these jobs profitable. One of the things that I have been concerned about uh, since the early 1980s, production workers, non-supervisory and production workers, that's about uh, three quarters of the workforce, make on average today about $22. That's about 50 cents less than they made in 1973. But during that period, Productivity of American workers has gone up by 77%. So there has been a tremendous shortfall in terms of the pocketbooks of working people in this country uh, and the growth of our economy. Now, we can have a lot of arguments about equity, and we should have a lot of arguments about equity. But there is a, there is a very real economic fact that isn't philosophy, it's numbers. If you increase your productivity, if your workers produce twice as much and they have the same level of income, who's going to buy the other half of what's being produced? Where's that going to go? Now, a lot of people, have, Walmart has been mentioned recently, and Walmart is kind of in the bullseye of this whole thing. They sell to the same group of people who have been decimated by this low-wage strategy. I'm actually going to jump in real quick because I think that's a really that's a good point to end on. I'm going to go to Nick. I saw, I saw yes. your hand go up. Michael has a question. 
Can someone use a KFC or KC's to take us through some actual numbers? How much would a business's bottom line increase as a result of a $15 an hour minimum wage? You know, so actually, in fact, it's interesting. I'll, I'll actually take the proponents' numbers on this. So there's a, a group of economists at the University of Massachusetts Amherst that are supportive of a $15 minimum wage, and they estimate that going from $7.25 to $15 an hour would cause about a 60% increase in the labor costs of a, of a fast food business. And so if if you look at a fast food business, uh, there's a company called Sageworks that keeps track of profit margins of these companies. And they put the profit margins of these companies at anywhere between two and four percent. So they're keeping two or four cents of each sales dollar in profit. And so those figures, I think, can actually help you understand a little bit why when a business owner looks at a $15 minimum wage proposal, they don't just, uh, they don't just see caution signs, they see their own mortality. Uh, because when you start thinking about a low margin business with 2% margins trying to cover a 60% increase in labor costs, and you're looking at a customer base that doesn't want to pay more than a couple dollars for its hamburger, you start to run into a problem. And that's where the tension happens. That's where if customers were always willing to pay a higher price, we wouldn't be having a minimum wage debate. But it's because of this tension that business owners have had to look at other options to reduce their labor costs. Um, whether it's automation, whether it's reducing staffing levels that ultimately do tend to create a negative effect of employment, uh, unemployment after the minimum wage goes up. There has been a lot of work on the effect of, uh, of increases in minimum wage. Yeah. Some, of the, some of the studies are really good and some of them are really bad. Michael and I agree on that. We just disagree on which ones are good and, <laughs> and which ones aren't. But one that I think is quite good uh, uh, happened in New Jersey uh, and it was really the, the New Jersey le legislature set up a very good study uh, because they increased the minimum wage in 1992 from, from uh, $4.25 an hour to $5.05. That's a 19% a increase. So think about Kansas City, Jackson County versus Johnson County. You, run, you push your wage up 19%. Uh, uh, Johnson County stays the same. What happens? Well, uh, a couple of guys at Princeton went out and they, they found 400 fast food restaurants and they, on both sides of the, uh, of the state line, the New Jersey side and the Pennsylvania side. And what they found was the labor change in both states was about the same. Yeah. There was very little change in both states. And the question is, why was there very little change? The biggest thing, by far was they saved a lot of money on training. Once they raised the wages, they kept their workers longer and they didn't have to retrain. We could spend a whole panel talking about what the, the literature does or doesn't say on the minimum wage. I do think it's important to note that what those economists, uh, uh, David Card and Alan Kruger did in New Jersey, other economists have taken that approach and they've said, we're, gonna look at, we're not gonna, just gonna look at one case study of one minimum wage increase. We're going to look at case studies across states of a lot of different minimum wage increases. And what they found over time, not every study, but most of the studies, about 85% of the studies on this topic since the early 1990s, have pointed to job loss following a wage increase. Now, again, that doesn't mean every study is going to point in that direction. There are going to be outliers. But I think if you look at the literature in its totality, you do see that most studies show that a higher minimum wage causes job loss. Let me say this about the, the minimum wage and, and, and unemployment levels. I think one of the biggest problems and one of the biggest challenges our country has is uh, enfranchising our youth and, and getting them involved in the labor market in a productive way. And uh, not only inner city youth, but, but all, all youth in general. The unemployment rate right now of Caucasian youth, and that being people between the ages of 16 and 24, this is per the BLS, is a little under 20 percent. The unemployment rate of African American youth between 16 and 24 is almost 40 percent. So I sit there and think about what does that really mean? It means we have a real problem with the employment base in our African American community. And I, frankly, I don't know how to, I don't know how to solve it. But I think by raising the, uh, the, the minimum wage by some big level, by doubling it from seven and a quarter to $15 an hour, I don't think that can help that unemployment problem at all, one way or the other. That's just, just my own common sense tells me that.
Still to come, more questions from our Village Square audience here at UMKC. But first, why does talk about the minimum wage always focus on the fast food industry? Area healthcare workers are also eyeing Kansas City's plans to raise the wage. Bridget Bowden in the KCPT Hale Center for Journalism profiles a home healthcare worker getting by on the bare minimum. I've been doing home care in CNA for five years. I have a two-year-old daughter named Rayera. I never, I can't afford daycare at all. Like, she never been to daycare ever. That's why I said I stayed at home with her. And now, like, that's why I have to work overnight because I can go to work while she sleep. Her $12 an hour salary keeps her constantly juggling expenses between rent, electric, and water. I got them gallons of water because our water is off, so it's just a little bit, yeah. The water's off right now? Yeah, it's off right now, so. How long's it been out? Um, probably about like two weeks now, two, three, yeah. <laughs> so we just use this water or whatever to, that's what I said we had, because our life was going to be off too, but I had, that's why I get the, I can't even didn't pay my rent. And I buzzed it right, but it just seems like it's. You, I still slip behind somehow. It's like, you know, like I've been paying my rent pretty good, but it's just like, you know, one thing get behind it. Cause I don't feel like she has every exactly thing. That biggest thing that goes for me is diapers. Like that's the biggest, biggest struggle. It's so hard to afford diapers. Now that's one of my biggest things I do go broke on. It's diapers, gas, and food. Those are the three biggest things. As a single mom, Lajua depends on family to help fill in the gaps with childcare, clothes, and occasionally groceries. That's what we have. And my grandma just brought us some food over before y'all came, and this is our refrigerator. She brought us these little things you can get from Dollar Tree. Days where I would have to go, literally, like, go without eating just for her to eat. So she would be able to eat. So it just makes it kind of like, the hard struggles, like I still make this much and I'm still, you know, still struggling super hard. Like, and, it, and it's very stressful, but I try to maintain because I don't want, you know, show that off to her because she don't know anything's going on. She's just living life. Like, she just here, like, okay. So I try to be as strong and try to not like show the emotions towards her so she won't be feeling like there's stuff wrong, even though I'm going through all of this. Uh, Hi, a little bit. But when I got my daughter, it's like, I can't be feeling sorry for me, you know. What I'm going to do, sitting here feeling sorry for myself and my daughter, you know, she needs these basic things and she needs to eat, she needs to do this. So it's it's really hard. Like, I didn't know it was going to be this hard in life, like, but it's really hard. <laughs> I'm still below average making $12. And, you know, I'm not saying like I want to complain, you know, like people say, well, okay, $10, okay, but... Not really. It's not enough to live. It's not enough to be able to survive on. You know, like as far as, you know, just a two bedroom house, you know, simple two bedroom, one daughter, working 40 hours a week, still can't even pay my bills. For Lajua, getting by would mean more time with her daughter and a chance to be part of her community. But it's just like, no matter how hard I try, no matter how many days of work, uh, work I work, I still end up behind, no matter what. It's like I push myself to the fullest, I push myself to the limit, and I'm still behind. Mm -hmm. She don't care. She want to be in the sun and burn up. <laughs> I need to go to Nick. I'm going to come back to you in a second. Yeah. Thanks for having your priorities right, Scott. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, Alan says he has a very selfish question, but how much more expensive would his cheeseburger get if we raise the minimum wage right here in Kansas City now now we're really putting these panelists on this on the spot here but Bill I think you're a smart guy I'm gonna throw that to you <laughs> I, the, the fact is I don't know the answer to that question <laughs> so I, I'm smart enough to know the, that, I, that I can say I don't know the answer to that question so, so I'm gonna assume since you're not from here you don't know the cost of a cheeseburger but could you give us a percentage increase you would expect <laughs> five dollar cheeseburger yeah, yeah five dollar cheeseburger so so there were two guys at the Chicago Federal Reserve that did look at the impact of an increase in the minimum wage on food costs and they looked at um, you know, I'm going to be a little hazy on these decimal points, but I want to. They looked at fast food, and it was about a 10% increase in the minimum wage. They said, I believe it was a two to three percent increase in the cost of fast food prices 
But their study said those fast food price increases happened in concert with a reduction in employment. So that assumed a 2 or 3% reduction in affected employment for those employees. If you were to just try and offset the cost of a minimum wage increase without also reducing employment, that price increase would likely be larger. I'm going to go back to my favorite roving reporter, KCPTs. Yes, our audience is getting restless. They have lots of questions, Scott, Let's beginning with Daniel. Daniel, would you mind standing for us? And your question for the panel, please. Why do we keep saying that fast food companies or restaurants generally was the example we gave, are relying on so-called thin profit margins when their thin profit margins are passing along multi-billion dollar profits to their parent corporations? Okay. Uh, why don't you answer that, Michael? <laughs> sure. So uh, if you look at a fast food company, here's a company that's going to have a profit per employee of, depending if it's a grocery store fast food, anywhere between two and $5,000 per employee. When you talk about going from a $7.65 minimum wage to a $15 minimum wage, you're going to eat up that profit per employee a couple times over. And so it doesn't really matter if they're a franchise business or not, it still makes their business model untenable. There is a lot of money sloshing around in these businesses that are so close to the margin. Uh, and I, you know, I, the, the, uh, the profits of uh, the fast food industry are, are well known. I, another, full service restaurants have become increasingly more parts of, of major corporate entities. Uh, and uh, there are about five really big ones. And all of, of those five uh, have CEOs that got compensation of, uh, of over $5 million last year. The average uh, CEO of the largest uh, full-service uh, brands makes about 780 times uh, the, the annual income of their, of their minimum wage employees. So they, they make more during breakfast than their uh, employees make all year long. Bridget Barry has a question for us. Bridget, would you mind standing? Thank you very much. Um, so it seems to me like if you gave everyone a livable wage, then state and federal prison and social service expenses would go down. Does that figure into economic models at all? The Congressional Budget Office actually looked at this question relative to the federal budget when it studied going from a, a minimum wage of 725 federally to 1010. And they looked at the numbers and they said they thought it was going to be about a wash. Because when you go to 1010, there are going to be some people who, uh, who now are using fewer uh, public benefits than they were before. But they said there's also going to be other people who are using more benefits than they were before. That if you actually raise the minimum wage and someone loses hours or loses their job, they're not just going to be partially dependent on the taxpayer. They're going to be 100% dependent on the taxpayer. And so in their estimation anyway, it was sort of a wash in terms of what the impact would be on taxpayers if you raise the minimum wage. Okay, Scott, did you want to say something? Yeah, real quick? I, um, there is an enormous number of these people that are getting that work full time uh, in these restaurants, and they are getting food stamps. Their kids are getting free school mil meals. One study indicated that that the subsidies that go to the employees of a single Olive Garden restaurant equals about two hundred thousand dollars a year. So. You know, I mean, the, the, there is a cost to paying people so little that they work, but they can't, uh, they can't survive. Nick. Yes. Uh, I'd just like as a housekeeping note to say thank you to uh, Olive Garden for providing the catering uh, for tonight's <laughs> meal. Uh, they may not do it again, though, but thanks for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm only kidding. What, I'm what only my kidding. number? Oh, right. <laughs> thank you. All right, Kirk Doan in Lee Summit has a question for us. Where is Kirk? Thank you, Kirk. I'm coming straight to you. Thank you. My question is, isn't this really just a tax that falls disproportionately on the job creators? And shouldn't we uh, spread this to all society by a government subsidy program? Um, the, the, the issue of the earned tax credit, I think if we as a, a people believe this is a social issue where we need to raise people's standards, raise hope, and and, and raise their, their, their living standards, then, and if businesses can't afford to do that, then I, then I think an earn, earn a tax credit, earned income tax credit is a, is a very viable solution. I think it's something we as a society need to truly think about 
That way the entire society absorbs the total cost of the, of the, of the pay increase and not necessarily this small business or that business or whatever it might be. Is it just another tax we're putting on businesses? Well, if you want to get at the, at the poverty questions that people are talking about, if you want to try to create more jobs for, you're going to have to have the government, you're going to have to have the public sector play a much more active role than they are now. As far as a tax, I mean, I, I, I go back to the, the New Jersey uh, 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 fast food places. Uh, those places did well because they kept their, their workers. And there was a study done comparing Sam's Club, which is a Walmart operation, with Costco. And Sam's Club paid as little as they could and just put up with the fact that people were coming and going and so forth. And Costco paid a lot more and gave good benefits and so forth. And this study said, look, Costco has got it figured out. Their cost of labor is actually lower than, than, than Sam's Club. They're making more money because they're paying higher wages. And Walmart wouldn't have anything. You know what happened? This year, this very year, Walmart and McDonald's both figured out that what they were, had been doing for 20 years was stupid, that it, pay, it paid them and their stockholders to pay more money to their workers, to keep them longer, to train them better, to get more efficiency, to have people out on the, on, the, on the floor that really believed in the company that they worked for. It works. So I don't think it's necessarily a tax. It can be a win-win, and it ought to be a win-win. Well, I, I actually, I think the difference there is that what McDonald's and Walmart decided to do is voluntarily raise their minimum wage. I think when you have a company like Walmart or McDonald's that looks at their customer base and says... But they didn't for 20 years. We think we... Well, actually, they have in the past. Walmart supported the last federal minimum wage increase. When they look at and they say, hey, we think we can raise our prices enough to offset this, it may make sense for them. But that doesn't mean it makes sense for everybody else. And I, I think we need to, you know, when we talk about business owners, I do think there's this idea of kind of the monopoly man that's hoarding all this cash. And it's true that if you look at like the, the executive team of Yum Brands, they make a lot of money. But at the same time, if you divided the compensation of the whole executive team of Yum Brands and handed it out to the company, you'd give everyone a couple cent an hour raise. You're really not gonna make a difference. And that's because it's not executive compensation that's driving the pay of employees. What's driving it is a, is a business model where customers are demanding low prices, where you have a low margin business and you have opportunities for people who don't have a lot of education or skills to get their start in the workforce. And I think if you went to your uh, local subway owner, the diner in your neighborhood, I think if you ask them, they're not making a couple million dollars a year. They may not even be making their mortgage payment. So I think those are the folks we need to keep in mind when we talk about the employers who are holding so much cash back. I don't think, I think that's a caricature. Nick. Sam has a question for us. So uh, I've heard different cities require a different wage based on their characteristics. So what characteristics should we examine to determine the appropriate wage raise? So in other words, what makes uh, San Francisco require a different wage than St. Louis? Cities like Seattle and, Los and, S and San Francisco that have been sort of the, the, on the forefront of going to a higher minimum wage, and, and San Francisco historically has had a higher minimum wage and, and additional um, requirements on top of that. Um, have had a, a customer base that, at least in their policymakers' estimation, has been um, more able to absorb higher prices. I think they may be getting a little ahead of themselves this time. I mean, I, I think if you look at, there was a restaurant in San Francisco called the Abbott Cellar that was twice voted one of the best top 100 restaurants in the city. Uh, they closed <coughs> earlier this year because of the $15 minimum wage. It was the straw that broke the camel's back for them. They'd still be open if it wasn't for that. So I think the, the concern is in some of these cities, even cities where you have customers that are, tend to be more wealthy, that tend to be a little less price sensitive, that maybe they may be reaching their outer limit. Now I think the question then when you start to go, when you look at cities like St. Louis, when you look at cities like Kansas City, hmm. where, where your, your customer base might be different than a Seattle or a San Francisco, what the appropriate minimum wage is, again, I think from my perspective, I tend to think that, um, that any increase in the minimum wage is counterproductive. But if I'm going to look at what other economists out there are saying, uh, someone like Dr. Dubé, for instance, yeah. you know, so he sort of pegs it, again, if you were going to look at, he says half the median wage, actually, yeah. is what he says. And so half the median wage, uh, the median hourly wage in Kansas City, uh, again, is somewhere in the range of $9 an hour or so. In St. Louis, it was the same. That's actually why the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, uh, which is, a, is a, a newspaper that has had a long record of advocating for an increase in the minimum wage, 
came out against the $15 proposal in St. Louis because they said, hey, you know, even economists like this are saying 15 might be a little too much, especially if in their case the county wasn't going to follow suit. I'm an economist, and so I'm looking at this truly just from an economic standpoint. But at $12 and $15 an hour, I know enough about the economy is that you try to solve one problem, as was stated on the earlier panel, it's like playing whack-a-mole. You know a little whack-a-mole game? You smack the, 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 the mole on the head, another one pops up. You got, and you got to smack that one. It's, and Milton Friedman, uh, economist that many of you probably don't agree with all of his, his theories and concepts, but he, he, he was a Nobel Prize winner. His fav, one of his favorite sayings was, in economics, there's no solutions, only trade-offs. So if we look at the idea of raising the minimum wage to 12, 15 bucks an hour, there's going to be things happening in the economy that no, because we haven't been to that level before as far as that kind of income level for minimum wage in relation to personal income, that's going to create issues. And I don't know what they are. And frankly, people that try to do their econom econometric models and so on and so forth, uh, they're probably smarter than me, but they don't know what they are either. So it's going to be a mystery. It's going to be a finding, a finding out process. But I do believe we're in an environment where we could probably ma raise the minimum wage up to nine, nine fifty an hour, and not be surprised from a labor market standpoint. Thanks, Bill. Nick, a basket of questions here from uh, Samantha and Adam and John. When it was mentioned about the Walmart volunteering to raise its minimum wage, when we have already got companies already raising their minimum wage, including IKEA responding to market forces, why do we need to do it ourselves when all of these companies are now responding to market forces? The evidence is that Walmart uh, is in part responding to a lot of very bad publicity, in part to the fact that uh, they know that the, that the uh, demographics of the, of the labor force are changing, and in part to the fact that they realize that they had a failed policy for the last 20 years uh, of doing that. But I don't think that we ought to wait for other, other companies to uh, wake up, because there are a lot of the companies in this country that won't wake up. And the workers that, that are employed by those companies shouldn't uh, have to pay the price. Help me thank my panel. Please. Thank you all for being here. Have a great night. Exactly.